Hello, and welcome back to GI 101. My name is Dr. Dan Sadowski, and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. In this podcast series, we have been discussing common clinical problems that arise from the gastrointestinal tract. With me today in the GI 101 studios is my co-host, Dr. Adriana Lazarescu. Adriana, last week we talked about the diagnosis of fecal incontinence. What are we going to talk about today? Well, Dan, after you have made sure that there is no sinister or reversible cause for the fecal incontinence, we need to talk about how to manage it. Okay, before we get to management, though, for our listeners, why don't we take a step back and review again briefly the physiology of normal continence. As stool travels through the colon, it eventually reaches the rectum where it accumulates. The rectum plays the role of reservoir. It has compliance, meaning that it can stretch so that the volume increases while the pressure remains the same. Obviously, this cannot go on forever. We do get to a point where the pressure will start to rise, and then two things happen. First, the patient has the sensation of a need to go and have a bowel movement. Second, through the rectoanal inhibitory reflex, or RARE, the internal anal sphincter will relax. The anal sphincter is interesting because it consists of two separate muscles. The internal anal sphincter is a tonically contracted muscle, which is involuntary. At rest, it sits closed. As I mentioned, it will relax and open with distension of the rectum. By contrast, the external anal sphincter is a voluntary muscle, which can be squeezed at will. This is the one that allows you to get to the bathroom in time when you do feel the need to go. All of these pieces work together to keep stool in the rectum and allow you to pass a bam movement only when you want to and when it is socially acceptable. Okay, so that's how things are supposed to work normally. How can we help people where one or more of these continence mechanisms do not work and they leak stool involuntarily? Regardless of what the underlying cause for a patient's fecal incontinence, the most important first step is to make sure that stool consistency is appropriate. What I mean is that anybody can become incontinent if their stool is loose enough or they have bad enough diarrhea. Having stool that is nice and formed and bulky can help with rectal sensation as well. For patients who present with fecal incontinence, I almost always start them on some fiber supplementation. The fiber will soak up fluid in the bowel and also bulk up the stool. So, can we do anything for patients who have weak anal sphincters? Yes, we can, but it depends on which of the anal sphincter muscles is the problem. For the internal anal sphincter, it is often injured during the delivery of a child, such as due to a tear or an episiotomy. Taking an obstetric history is quite important. If the internal anal sphincter is found to be weak on anal rectal manometry, I would then refer the patient for an endoanal ultrasound. I'm looking for a break in the muscle, which looks like a piece missing from a donut. If there is indeed a tear in the internal anal sphincter, it can sometimes be surgically repaired, which strengthens the muscle. For the external anal sphincter, because it is a voluntary muscle, it can be trained and strengthened like any other muscle in your arms or legs. Biofeedback is a therapy which can strengthen the external anal sphincter muscle and allow people to reach the bathroom in time without having an accident. So, is there anything else we can do for patients who have very weak anal sphincters? If the sphincter cannot be saved, muscles from somewhere else in the body can be transplanted into the pelvis to create a new sphincter. One example would be the gracilis muscle. There's also such a thing as an artificial sphincter. Other treatment modalities include the injection of bulking agents into the hemorrhoidal cushions, which essentially narrows the anal canal and impedes the inadvertent passage of stool. Just as an aside, I would like to mention that some centers are actually able to offer sacral nerve stimulation, which is a pacemaker device that tonically contracts the external anal sphincter and can improve continence in some patients. And I suppose, Adriana, that for those who are refractory to all treatments, Sometimes the only option is a colostomy. It is important to note that many patients often require more than just one of the previously discussed treatments. We combine several treatment modalities to achieve full continence. 
Okay, thanks for that excellent review of the treatment modalities for fecal incontinence. For our listeners, we hope you found today's podcast useful. Join us next week for another episode of GI 101. Bye!